traveling Europe full-time for almost five months now, and I've been covering my adventures on the show. We first hiked the Dolomites in episode 103, and then in episode 105, we hiked, biked, and paddled on my multi-sport adventures in Slovenia. Today, we head to beautiful Croatia, where I'll be on a two-mast motor yacht with a fun group of about two dozen fellow bikers. We'll be biking the amazing coastal landscape as we island hop from Split to Dubrovnik on an adventure that checks all the boxes for fun, beauty, culture, history, and food. I can't wait to share it with you, so let's get started. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. Today, we're going to be heading to Croatia's absolutely stunning coastline along the Adriatic Sea. I've been looking for a great European bike touring company that I could recommend to you, and I'm thrilled to announce that because of this particular biking adventure, I found one in BoatBikeTours.com, who is the tour operator for my Croatian cycling island hopping adventure. I was thrilled with the tour itself, with the quality of the guides, the quality of the bikes, the beautiful boat. Everything was top notch. Our Croatian group itself was put together by popular travel blogger, Traveling Jackie and her Jump Adventures group. I'm gonna put a link in the show notes to both her blog and to her Jump Adventures. You first met Jackie on her Quebec episode number 33, which I'll also link to in the show notes. The long-term trip I've been on started in Venice and I'm slowly working my way around the Eastern shore of the Adriatic Sea. So at first I was in Italy, then Slovenia, and today I head to Croatia. On the way to meet my group and split from my boat and bike tour, I first do a bit of exploring on my own. I visit the capital Zagreb, Plitvitsia Lakes, I think I mispronounced that, I'm sure I mispronounced that. And this Vitsia Lakes is one of the most amazing landscapes I've ever seen. I visited coastal Zadar, and then I made my way down to Split. We're gonna cover all this and more on today's show. You're gonna definitely add Croatia to your travel list. Crossing the border from Slovenia to Croatia went smoother than expected. Just before the border, the train stopped and an inspector asked to see my ticket and passport, asking which day I arrived. He found the stamp from Italy where I arrived on the 8th and then stamped my exit. In the 26th country, Schengen area of Europe, I'm allowed to visit without a visa for a rolling 90 days out of 120 days. So as I entered and exit the Schengen zone, all the days I spent recently in Italy and Slovenia are going to be added up to make sure I haven't exceeded my 90 days. So far, I've used up about a third of my allotment on this trip. But since Croatia is out of the Schengen area, the meter stops for now. Slovenia is the only Balkan state in the Schengen zone, which is comprised of European countries, but not all of the European countries that are part of the EU. I plan to explore the Balkans for the next three months, and then I'm gonna use up the last 60 days in the Schengen area at the new year. At least that's my current plan. A few minutes after the inspector stamps my passport, Another inspector opens the six-seated compartment I'm sharing with Eva and David, fellow solo travelers I met while waiting for the train. This inspector is from Croatia, and he not only wants to see my stamp on my passport for entry, but also my vaccination card. 30 minutes later, we arrive in Zagreb in a solid rain. Fortunately, my lodging is close by and I, and I don't get too drenched. In cities, often to save money, I will book a private room in a, in a hostel. This has several advantages. I can stay in a great area near the historical old towns at an affordable rate. Plus I'll have the opportunity to meet other travelers and have access to a kitchen and a living area. But this is the off season and I seem to have the place to myself. In three days, I saw only one other gal. At the desk, I'm given a map, some tourist brochures and a general overview of the area. The guy suggests which street has the best choice of restaurants. And even though the weather is absolutely lousy, I'm convinced it's worth a five minute walk in the dark rain to get some dinner. And he wasn't kidding. The streets are lined with cafe after cafe offering every kind of cuisine. Some might just be coffee or alcohol bars, but there's plenty of sit down restaurants with outdoor eating areas under large umbrellas. Many have heaters to take off the chill. Some offer a blanket. Europeans tend to eat outside regardless of the weather. I love this tradition, but always pack my thermal jacket, my day pack, just so I can add an extra layer when I need to. I settled on the Sri Lankan curry bowl restaurant and ordered the black pork curry bowl seasoned to Sri Lankan taste buds. They offer a lower kick Croatian style and also are you crazy heat as well. I have definitely made the right choice. It's super spicy, but you can taste the delicious slow cooked pork. The heat takes the edge off the chilly wet night. 
Afterwards, even though I don't have a sweet tooth, I decide to try the homemade avocado ice cream drizzled with caramel and sprinkled with pistachios. I teased my waiter, Ore, that it couldn't possibly taste good, but I was wrong. It was delicious. The next day, I booked a communism and war tour in the afternoon, which gave me the morning to explore the old city with the self-guided walking tour map the hostel gave me. I'm only a couple blocks from the Central Square, named after former Governor Ben Joseph Jalassi. I apologize for all the mispronunciations. I'm just butchering them. I'm sorry. You know how terrible I am with pronunciations to start with. Now add to the fact that they have letters that I have zero clue as to how to pronounce. The governor's statue is of him proudly on his mount with a sword in hand. He originally faced north to symbolize his defense of Croatian rights against Hungary, but was later turned to face south to better fit the layout of the square. During Tito's communistic rule, he was removed altogether as Tito wanted to create a unified Yugoslavia and one way to minimize nationalistic pride was to remove historical icons. Next to the statue is a fountain from an old spring that Zagreb originally obtained its drinking water from. Legend has it that an old Croatian soldier returned from battle and asked a beautiful maiden to scoop up some water for him. Zagrebidi means to scoop up water and that's how the city became known as Zagreb. The fountain itself is named for the maiden. Slightly north is the beautiful Neo-Gothic Cathedral of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. A major earthquake in 1880 caused it to be renovated to its current late 19th century Neo-Gothic style, although its origins date back to 1094. Surrounding the cathedral, you see remnants of the turreted Renaissance outer walls built to defend against the Ottoman Turks. During the communist period, the cathedral, along with other religious buildings in Yugoslavia, were neglected. I love how there are a few exhibits surrounding the cathedral, which is currently being renovated, where the replacement sculptures sit side by side by their replacements. You get to see the, the difference. Down the hill in the affectionately known belly of Zagreb is Croatia's largest and most colorful market, the Dolak market, where you can daily pick up your fruit, vegetables, meat, and fish. Virtually everything but the bananas are grown here in Croatia, and most are organic, so while they may not be the prettiest, the varieties grown have superb taste. My guide Dan suggests on a later tour, it's good to canvas the market to get the best price because some of them buy from the others in the market and then just mark them up. He also suggests buying from the grannies. Heading up Zagreb's most colorful street, oh, here comes a good one, Tlaxikiva, I come across one of the rare female statues on my trip, that of writer Marja Zurich Zagorka. One of her most famous novels is about the women accused of being witches during the 17th century by the church and were burned at the stake. They were thought to have trysts at the earlier mentioned maiden fountain. In her writing, Zogorka encourages women to fight for their rights. Just around the bend is Zagreb's last remaining stone town gate. Just inside is an open-air chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary. There's a painting of the Virgin that miraculously was spared in a 1731 fire, and this chapel has been a pilgrimage site ever since. There are a few benches to sit on and pray, and candles you can light for your intentions. It's quite beautiful, but a bit unnerving that the cobblestone pedestrian road goes right smack between the pews and the painting. Over on Stone Street, Kamenita Ulica, you'll find the oldest pharmacy in Zagreb. It has been in business almost 800 years, since 1355, which is a little hard for me to wrap my head around. Over on Apatka Street, it's lined with palaces, and despite all the wars, many of Zagreb's beautiful buildings remain. St. Mark's Church, known for its colorfully tiled roof, is a cheerful sight. Nearby is the Museum of Broken Relationships. Inside, folks who have had their hearts broken donate a symbol of the failed relationship that they haven't been able to part with, at least until now. Next to each totem is a description of why the item is significant. The stories are poignant, heartbreaking, and often funny. The museum started as a traveling exhibit, but grew into a permanent one in Zagreb. According to the museum, quote, our societies acknowledge marriages, funerals, and even graduation farewells, but deny us any kind of formal recognition of the demise of a relationship despite its strong emotional effect. End quote. Many brokenhearted have embraced this opportunity to donate their totems. I think because although they want to get it out of their life, they really don't want to see it tossed in the trash either. My favorite one was the most ridiculous hand-knitted sweater. It had large intentional gaps in the back, one sleeve was grotesquely long, it had a red heart on the wrong side of the body, and it was knitted over. 
I found the exhibit fascinating. I encourage you to see it should the traveling exhibit come to your area. You can also check out the La Scrap Tower, a preserved 13th century fortification tower, complete with a cannon that normally shoots off at noon, but was currently out for repair. The bells used to summon the townsfolk to return to the town at sunset when the gates were locked up. After walking the old upper town, I headed to the Strassmeyer Promenade and got a nice overlook of the lower town. You can also take the short funicular down. My 3 p.m. communism and war tour with Free Spirit Tours was outstanding. Luca broke down the complicated history of Croatia and Yugoslavia so that we all could understand it. We learned the good and the bad of Tito, who I learned was quite the clever politician. He understood people, and he could be charming as well as ruthless in governing his own brand of communism. He managed to get the support of both the U.S. and the Axis powers by playing one against the other and never totally aligning either with the U.S. or Russia. He was so good at it that when Hollywood wanted to film a movie starring Richard Burton as Tito in 1973's Battle of the Sudjeska, Tito said no need to rent or make up the war machines. He had the actual ones they could use, plus the soldiers. He even let them destroy the actual bridge instead of faking it, making this one of the most expensive films ever made in Yugoslavia. At Tito's 1980 funeral, 120 of around 140 countries at the time sent a delegation, which included Margaret Thatcher and Jimmy Carter's mom. One of the most interesting stories Luca, who was a small child during the early 90s war, told us that when he was a child, all the rage was to fill in these coloring sticker books. When you bought a particular brand of chocolate, inside was a sticker of an exotic animal. You would stick your sticker in the book on the correct block of the animal and then color around the sticker and then you'd learn on the adjacent page all about the animal. And then when you completely filled up the book with all the right stickers, you mailed it to the chocolate factory, which would then send you a huge chocolate bar. Very clever marketing, I think. But what was really interesting to me was that during the war, the chocolate company switched from the exotic animals to war machineries. So now the small children were collecting tank and firearm stickers instead of giraffes and lions. Likewise, they also collected the small plastic soldiers and tanks, etc. When the air raid sirens pealed, as they often did, Luca, at four years old, equated the sound with playtime as everyone stopped what they were doing to hide from potential bombs. Adults would gather their pre-packed food and drink, and Luca would collect a special toy pouch that he could only use during the air raids. So while the adults chatted on the sidelines underground, Luca and the other kids would play war games with plastic soldiers, guns, and tanks in the basement or tunnels. Of course, none of them wanted to play for the Serbian side, so they always overran them. Another interesting tour I took was with Dan to learn about communist life in Zagreb. So instead of walking the old town where I learned about the 1991-95 to Homeland War, we headed across the Sava River where the communists expanded Zagreb. Frankly, the boxy and usually unattractive buildings over there was what I was expecting of both Slovenia and Croatia. Why was I wrong there? Both countries have gorgeous architecture. So in the communist development area, they have apartment buildings nicknamed Mammoth that house 5,000 people, which technically is large enough to be its own village. In these developments, you'll find the huge apartment buildings, a market and pharmacy, and some green space. Everything else, including the jobs, required a commute. During communism, you were assigned an apartment based on your family size, and if you couldn't find a job you wanted, you were assigned one. After Tito died, the economy was in bad shape and Yugoslavia was broken up into the Balkan states we know today. If you make it to Zagreb, I would strongly encourage you to take both Luca's and Dan's tour. I'll link to both in the show notes. They were fascinating and enlightening. After all that history and culture, it was time to get out into the country. My next stop, Magical Plitvice Lakes. I'm just gonna call it Plitvice Lakes. That's the way you spell it. One of the oldest and largest national parks in Croatia. It's been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1979, and the more than 70,000 acres is known for its outstanding tufa lakes and caves, all connected by waterfalls. Tufa is a variety of limestone formed when carbonate minerals precipitate out of ambient temperature water. So what that means is these cool mineral deposits form lakes that have breakthroughs that create the waterfalls. And when I say waterfalls, think all caps waterfalls. I'll explain more in a minute, but first, a little backstory on me getting there. I got the impression when I was looking for lodging that the area was small, since I could hardly find anything available, to, especially anything affordable. 
So I settled on a private cabin at a campground. I snapped a photo of the address and figured I'd be easy to find the hotel when I arrived, but to be safe the night before, I rode to the campground asking which bus stop I should get off and any directions that would be helpful. I hadn't heard back by the time I got on my bus and lost cell coverage, but I figured it shouldn't be too hard to find. I figured the town's going to be tiny. I made a strategic transportation error by not showing my bus driver the name of my campground. I just showed him the name of the town I wanted to get off in since I couldn't pronounce it. I dutifully followed the bus as it drove along the road along using my map app, and the driver and my map app were in, were in concurrence when it stopped in the little tiny village, no, no street lights, the little teeny town, and let me off in the rain. I had no cell service, so I couldn't use my map to find the campground. So I went into the only open business, a cafe, and inquired. She didn't speak English, and of course I couldn't speak Croatian, so via pantomime and and the few words that we both kind of knew a little bit, it sounded like she was telling me it's five kilometers down the road. How could that be? I was right in the middle of town. I asked about taking a taxi, and they laughed and said there's no taxis here. I had no choice but to trust them and to start walking. It was uphill, but gratefully a gradual uphill. And did I mention it was raining? About a half hour up the road, I came to a larger village, and I see a tourist information sign. Yay! I get there. It's locked. But I see a taxi sign. No taxis. Huh. Things are not going well today. But up ahead, I see good news. There's a sign from my campground saying it's two kilometers up ahead. So that's roughly less than a mile and a half to go. Then I see my, my bus, the bus I took, is now in the reverse trip back, and the driver is staring at me oddly as I'm marching up the highway. I continue on. I have passed at least three bus stops so far. No doubt he was wondering why I didn't get dropped off closer to where I wanted to go. That's when it dawns on me that my campground must use that village's post office as the mailing address town. I've lived in small towns before that didn't have a post office. So memo to self, don't assume anymore when it comes to addresses. Eventually, drenched in cold, I make it to the campground and I have to smile when I see a bus stop right in front of it. Waterlogged, I check into my cabin. It is then that I realize I have simply booked a two twin bed cabin with a single bare overhead light and no heat. There's a wool blanket on each bed, but I'm worried I'm going to be cold tonight. So I pad back to the check-in gate and request a couple more blankets. I'm happy to report that with four wool blankets, I was nice and toasty each night. I'm also hungry as by now it's almost 3 p.m. In the toasty dining room, my lovely waiter serves me up an outstanding goulash feast that warms my spirits. I'm glad I booked half board, meaning I get fed breakfast and either lunch or dinner each day. The food was always great and plentiful. I can also get Wi-Fi in the dining room, so I check my messages. Oops, there's one from the front desk which read, tell the driver you're staying at this campground, he'll drop you off right in front of the campground. <laughs> of course, the response came after I'd already gotten off the bus and had no cell service to retrieve it. Lesson learned. When in doubt, I'm going to from now on show the driver both the town name and where I'm staying, or better yet, check several days in advance, and I won't try to cut it so short in the future. At least I got a workout out of it. The next day, the weather was even worse. I decided to wait one more day to visit the lakes. My cabin was too cold and dark to get any work done, so I moved to the dining hall where it was overly warm and bright. When I awoke the next day, hooray, the sun's out. I wanted to catch the free morning shuttle to the lakes. They have a bus that takes you there and brings you back at specific times each day. En route, we passed dozens of accommodations. This must be a really popular place if I had such problems finding a place to stay, at least for a reasonable price. So if you go, make sure you book your accommodations early so you get options. When the bus arrived, I found out why it's so popular. Wow. And I mean, wow. There are eight lakes of varying sizes that a river runs through. The tufa, that, that, that buildup I talked about, has formed these lakes, and where the mineral crust breaks, a waterfall appears. After all the heavy rain that I've been dealing with the last few days, the lakes and the river are just bulging with water, forming waterfalls that I imagine aren't normally there. It's been a highlight of my trip, and I've yet to see a more impressive waterfall show, and that includes Niagara Falls, which obviously is much bigger. Over a million people visit each year, most just taking a day trip from Zagreb, Split, or Zadar. The problem with doing a day trip here is you have time to get there, 
Walk to the main waterfall, but that's quite impressive and worth it if that's all you can do. You might have time for a little boat ride to see a bit more, but that's it. However, if you stay overnight, there's a long trail that goes around the entire lake structure that takes the better part of a day to walk, and that gives you time for lunch and a gazillion photo stops. And there's lots of other trails into the mountains. So hikers should plan for at least a couple days here. You've got to go to activetraveladventures.com to see the photos of these crystal clear lakes filled with hundreds, and I do mean hundreds of waterfalls. I'll bet I saw more than 150 of them that day. It was truly magical and deserving of its UNESCO designation. I should mention that throughout Croatia, the water is super clean and drinkable everywhere, even public water fountains where you're gonna see spigots often on the side of some kind of a decorative sculpture. And you can refill your water bottles with delicious mineral water. The water's not being recirculated, so you don't have to worry about that. It's coming out nice, fresh, and clean, and delicious. My next stop was Zadar, a coastal historical resort town. Like so much of Europe, it has the fun winding alleys and cobblestone streets with beautiful architecture and churches. Again, I got a private room in a hostel, and my room overlooked the square with the sea in the background. Don't knock hostels, especially if you get a private room. They're often in great locations, at least for me, that would be affordable or be too cheap to pay for hotel-wise. Some of them you can even get a private ensuite bath. The town has two cool attractions on the point where the boats come into the shelter of the harbor. One is a wind and sea driven pipe organ. As the waves and winds push underneath the promenade built with these little pipe channels up to the ground, the air is forced through these pipes and forms this otherworldly music. I'm surprised at how often, even these many months later, that I still think of that sea organ. The best description I can come up with, what the sound is, is picture the jolly green giant playing a recorder. You know one of those plastic flute light instruments you got in grammar school, or at least I did? Here's a recording that I made. That's the sea and the wind making music. On that same point, next to the sea organ, is a circular solar light floor show that you can walk on called the Monument to the Sun or Greeting to the Sun. It was built to symbolize communication with light just as the sea organ communicates with sound. The 300 multi-layered glass pieces come on at night to put on a show. The panels of light dance across the promenade. Many people dance on top of the lights. It makes for a fantastical light show. I'll put some pictures on the website. Speaking of sunset, there's a sign telling us that Alfred Hitchcock said this of Zadar's sunset. Zadar has the most beautiful sunset in the world, more beautiful than the one in Key West. I made a point to check out the sunset every night I was in Zadar. It was beautiful. One night at dinner, I was sitting alone when another gal came in solo. After she sat down, we made eye contact and with quick pantomime, decided we're gonna eat dinner together. That's how I came to meet Boronozzi. Afterwards, we went to enjoy the light show and she and I still keep up on Facebook. After Zadar, now it's time to hit the city of Split. I planned to arrive a few days early where I'd meet up with Jenny from the Flagstaff episode number 65. She and I were gonna share an Airbnb in Split and be roomies on the boat. I hadn't seen Jenny since she took out my elbow stitches last spring when I was in Flagstaff, out when I was tootling around in Sophie. It's going to be good to catch up. On our first night, also in town, was Becky Rupp of Trailblazer Wellness, my online personal training affiliate and friend, and her husband Randy. They were doing a similar bike and boat tour as Jenny and I were going to do, but they were leaving the day before us. Split is a beautiful old fortified city that's still in great shape. It's hilly and sits on the Adriatic coast. Virtually all the homes are topped with red clay terracotta tiles. Terracotta actually means baked earth. It's said that the shape is because they would mold the clay over one's thigh. The effect is utterly charming with the red cap roofs over the stark white stone buildings and winding cobblestone streets and alleys. We spent our time exploring the sites and learning its history. 
Like many places around here, Game of Thrones fans will recognize some of the landmarks, like the Cliss Fortress and the Diocletian Palace. When we met up with our group that first night, we went on an official history tour. One of the more interesting tidbits we learned is that after the fall of communism, the problem is what to do about all those private homes confiscated by the communists that were now housing residents. It was decided that the tenants living after the fall would get to live out their lives in their apartments for a nominal rent. But when the last tenant died in that apartment, the building would then revert back to the original private owner. So those housing tenants have not been maintained since the tenants don't want to pay for the building they don't own and the future owners don't want to pay for a building they may only be getting 20 euros a month in rent and they may not have possession for decades. So in what is a lovely section of the city, you will now see fully renovated, beautiful buildings next to tenement dumps where the poor people collect recyclables for the extra money and store full trash bags full of cans and bottles that they can turn in for cash. What was one of the worst areas of town is slowly over time as the previous tenants die becoming one of the best. Croatia gained independence from former Yugoslavia in 1991, so it's only been 30 years and there's still a lot of life yet in those tenants. A funny story. A guide explains that everyone in town knows everybody else's business. There was a married couple who famously argued. There is a sculpture of this couple on the side of a prominent building with the husband shaking his fist as his wife, who is giving him the finger. That's not something you regularly see in a building. Diocletian's palace is an ancient palace built for the Romans and has an interesting backstory as well. The palace was built for Diocletian, the son of a freed slave turned emperor. He told people he was a god and the son of Zeus. No one was allowed to look at him. Someone did all the speaking for him. He was carried everywhere, and he built walls because he was afraid of Christians with whom he was merciless. When he died, no one in Rome wanted split, but eventually the church came in and built the Cathedral of St. Dominus on top of his grave, kind of a spite, within the palace and built the bell tower adjacent. There's tons of interesting history in Croatia, so be sure to allow time to explore when you arrive. Also be sure to hike up the mountain where the sea enters the harbor for a spectacular view of the city and its shoreline below. Jenny and I are doing this bike and boat cruise in mid-October. It's cooler than we thought it was going to be. But Jenny gets the bright idea, let's go find a thrift store. She wants a puffy jacket. I've got one of those, but I didn't bring a fleece pullover that I think now is a mistake. I need something that's not quite as heavy as a jacket, but just a little bit more. She finds the perfect place and we both hit pay dirt. I'll bet you I have worn this fleece pullover a hundred times in the last five months. I can wash it and it's dry by morning and it breathes much better than my puffy jacket. So a fleece jacket is going on my list everywhere I go from now on. After our walking history tour of Split, it's time for our adventure to begin. For the next seven nights, we're gonna be staying on board the Papa Privy, a sailing motor yacht almost 100 foot long by more than 20 feet wide. There are three levels with cabins. Ours is in the middle. We have a nice private bathroom and surprisingly, plenty of storage space. There's a sun deck up on top, plus a covered deck and enclosed dining room on the middle deck. Off the stern is a platform you can jump in the sea for a quick swim break, as many of us do. Or you can also jump off the top deck, as also a lot of people do. We have a nice group of about two dozen people. Most are traveling solo, but there are also four couples and some friends traveling together. We range in age from, I'm guessing, late 20s, early 30s, up to the 60s, with a good mix of both spectrums, and just slightly more females than males. On the evening of our first night, we had a celebratory party on board. There's lots of laughing and dancing, and adult beverages were consumed as we all got to know each other. I can see that this show is going to run long, so I think what I'll do is I'm going to break this into a two-parter so the first part is going to be what I've obviously what I just covered. We're talking a little bit about the culture and getting to Split to start the biking adventure. And so I will also do a second episode on the actual biking trip. That way you're not listening to a two-hour podcast all at one time. Croatia is a super cool country. And on this trip, I've been to 11 countries. And that's right up there is one of my favorites. And we talked about Split and Dubrovnik. I liked even better than Split, so I can't wait to tell you about that in our next episode. 
before I sign off, I do want to thank you for using my Amazon link, which I'll, again, I'll put a link in the show notes on that. If you would, please bookmark that. If you use my link to access Amazon, no matter what it is that you end up buying there, I get credit for it at no additional cost to you and helps to phrase some of the costs of this podcast, the website, etc. So again, I appreciate you using my Amazon link whenever you do your shopping there. Every little bit helps and I'm most grateful. I hope you've enjoyed I hope you've enjoyed this first part of my adventures in Croatia. And I really appreciate you listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks. Adventure on!